global means of communication around the world very fast, very effective. Well, that should be transformed into a better world with more respect for human rights and not less. And in this sense, this, as Lisa was explaining, was the idea of this particular panel drawing from a lot of the other panels that you have had to try to draw some conclusions around social media. First, when we talk about social media, normally we're thinking about uh, the social networks. But let me begin a little bit backwards. Social media is the media that we use that is not of commercial nature, that is in a, a, a voluntary exchange of views and positions. And the social media really began with broadcasting or with community newspapers or journals or community broadcasting in terms of community radios or even community television. It was a public service of all the community, not at the interest of anyone in particular, but of all at the same time. But obviously, when this evolves into the internet and it becomes this sort of social communication, this public service, using this excellent medium, this openness of, of the internet, then it has a new added element, which is that it becomes an interactive form of communication. It's no longer the passive form of broadcasting when a group of people were broadcasting to another or communicating. In this case, is effective, systematic, and constant interactive communication of all. And I think this is, and this is where then it develops into the social networks that create a more specific type of framework for that interactive communication. Obviously, there is a tremendous good and a tremendous function in this. But at the same time, there are perils and fears in it as well. I remember that when, I, when, when the, the, the internet networks began, I was living in Washington, and the people living in Tacoma Park decided that they wanted to do their first neighborhood network. And they were worried, this was an experiment, this is many years ago, and they were worried that this was going to ruin their personal neighborhood relations because everyone was going to communicate by internet and not directly in a friendly manner in a personal way. A few weeks later, I spoke to them, and a few months later, I spoke to them to see how the experience had gone. And many commented that no, it had actually enhanced communication because if an older person would come out of their house and find that their car had a flat tire, they would come back in and immediately ask for help on the web for anyone in the neighborhood near their address that could come and help them change that tire. And that effectively happened. Some people began asking for help to babysit and to take care of the children. And it ended up, instead of reducing the personal relationship, enhancing the personal relationships. Well, I believe that this experience in the neighborhood can actually now be transported, this was many years ago, transported to the world. This should enhance this sort of neighborly relationship and should enhance the exercise of rights around the world. But of course, there are legitimate concerns for security and there are legitimate concerns for privacy. Can this openness guarantee both? And here, as following on what, what David was saying, I, I, I actually like to say that it's not exactly a balance what we're looking for between privacy and security. Because the balance seems that you're giving in one to achieve the other systematically. I think we have to begin by saying number one is that privacy is a right. It's a fundamental right of anyone and it is a permanent right. And security is a necessity for exercising all rights. So it doesn't mean that we have to give away our right to privacy or that we have to give away the protection of security or a right to security. So I believe that we have to see how we can enhance both simultaneously and, and not allow that one erodes the other. One of the, the reasons why this is becoming a discussion now is because clearly the internet was sort of, and, and, and especially the social networks, which began as sort of a friendly experiment and all of a sudden exploded around the world because they, they actually responded to a necessity of communication that people had. And I think they grew much faster. And obviously, was much less, or was no regulation at the beginning. In one of the panels, I remember someone said, internet grew so fast because it had the element of open creativity because no one had regulated it. Number one is because no one knew how fast it was going to go and no one knew how to regulate it, but also was an experiment to let it flow freely. But now, 
you begin to understand that many of those uh, facts uh, that data placed on, on the web can actually be transported to someone else. As David was saying, some of that has to be lodged in a different place for security, but eventually it could also be sold or sent to someone else. I remember that in the, in the, um, in the, in the uh, IFJ conference at Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, there was one person made a presentation that was called the end of the ephemeral because it said before our communication was simple. What we wanted to leave on the record, we would put it in writing. And we were very careful and very cautious in what we put on the paper because we knew that was going to be filed somewhere. But then whatever else we wanted to say, we would say it by word. And we could be very open about it and introduce ourselves and give openness about our ideas because we knew that those words would go with the wind. That was the ephemeral, he says. But now we're getting into a new habit, which is we write on the internet as we speak freely. And we want to write with the same freedom. So we put everything there. And we say everything we think. And you go into a chat room and you begin just letting everything out. Or into a, a social network and you put all your information and your family information and everyone else's. And you do it so openly that you never thought that that could eventually end up in someone else's hands. Ironically, one of the examples I, I also received in one of the, the panels is that a friend of mine got as a present, they sent to him two photographs of his childhood, which he personally doesn't have and no one in his family had. He doesn't know where they appeared, but someone just sent them over, over to him uh, to his address. So this is the, the speed and the fastness and the openness which this moves creates a serious challenge for security. And in this security-oriented world, the idea that all this information actually has a tremendous value, a value for security, but also commercial value. And these are elements that were probably not thought of at the beginning, that will force some form of regulation uh, in, in the future to defend, like I said, the basic rights, to defend the right to privacy, but also to defend security as something necessary. And in that sense, we would like to call on some of the panelists 